If you were to be remembered as the man who has made the Lord of the Rings, would you rather be remembered as a man who has said something or as a man who has made something? I don't think you can distinguish. The made thing, unless it says something, won't be remembered. Thank you. Storytelling is the oldest form of communication. Stories have been used to present a thought or perspective to an audience, to make words come alive. It dates back before recorded history, likely when we were still simple hunter-gatherers sitting around a fire sharing our experiences, like the time we found a berry bush by the river, or when we fed the wolf that hangs by our favorite rock. It is a concept deeply ingrained within our psychology, so it may be somewhat of a surprise that the concept of world-building, in its purest definition, is something that began in the 20th century. Certainly, fiction is much older, having likely started around the 12th century. But the concept of constructing an entire fictional world separate from our own with its own rules, history, geography, and even races is fairly new. Much of this concept was pioneered by fiction writers like C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien. But how exactly is a typical fiction story's world different from something like Tolkien's Middle Earth? To put simply, one author is writing a character that could sustain multiple stories. The other is creating an entire world that can sustain multiple characters and their respective stories within. If I were to ask someone, who is the main character of the Toho Project? The answer would obviously be Hakurei Reimu. But what if there was no Reimu? Could the world stand on its own narratively? The answer is yes. Never mind games or literature starring other characters. Simply refer to fan works and the breadth of characters that are expanded from both fan and canon interpretation. The Toho Project is not simply a story about Hakurei Reimu. It arguably isn't even really a story. It's simply the ever-changing world of Ginsokyo. While the rules of the world are arguably fantastical in nature, they are representative of fantasy itself, the answer of mysteries that modern society has abandoned in favor of scientific explanation. In other words, the world operates on rules derivative of our reality. Gensokyo has a shared history with our world up until Japan's Meiji era. The races of the world are all based upon real-world mythologies. And yes, races of other pure fictional universes have basis in our reality as well. But yokai are defined by the perception of the real world. The beliefs of real people and history are translocated into this fictional world, this microcosm of Japanese myth given life. Well, for instance, yeah. this whole matter of the appendices, 100 pages, language, social customs, history. Normally, if you had been writing a history as a historian, all these would have existed on a card index before you ever began to write. Yeah. Is this true for well, the Lord of the Rings? So, yes. One thing that, for instance, the remarks you made at the beginning was the fact that uh, uh, time passed and the uh, and the, the hobbits grew into this world. Yes. Matter of fact, what really happened was that uh, because having already constructed the world, they became drawn into it. Aside from being a writer, J.R.R. Tolkien was a poet, a linguist, and an academic. In the process of building his world of Middle Earth through connected stories, he constructed poems, the geography of the world histories of various settlements and races, and even entire languages that were spoken by the people. While inspirations can be inferred or have been confirmed by Tolkien himself, there exists no explicit reference to our real-life world anywhere within the writing. And while this level of detail is not nearly as extensive, the same can be said of the Star Wars universe. On the contrary, the Toho Project more resembles the Harry Potter universe in that the real world exists, but there is a world beyond it that defies conventional logic. But the Toho Project finds itself in a unique and arguably ideal position, a position that none of the previous mentioned worlds can claim for themselves. Not only is Gensokyo framed in the context of real life, but even the basis of its fantastical elements are found in reality. There are yokai from Japanese mythology, fairies and vampires from European mythology, and gods from a variety of religions. Yet when Zun pulls from these sources, he takes considerable creative liberty and modifies them in such a way to fit the world he wants to make. Kappa are technologically advanced. The rabbits on the moon have guns. This fairy 
is wearing the American flag. All of these unique concepts are still at their core based upon existing myth. There are two main benefits to this. Number one, Zoom can draw upon all of human history's myth as he sees fit while tweaking whatever he wants. Number two, fans are able to piece together things or speculate based on actual mythological record. For example, Kogaso is speculated to be an Ippon Datara, a yokai related to blacksmithing, from her design, name, and its myth related to the Karakasa before she was ever revealed to be a blacksmith. Kasen was all but confirmed to be the Oni Ibaraki Doji the moment she was introduced due to her last name being Ibaraki, and the fact that two other Oni Devas had already been introduced. In the same vein, people love to speculate over the appearance of the fourth and final Deva, the relationship between Kasen and Yoshika, or even the potential relationship between Sagume and Seija. Gensokyo allows for real-world mythology to do the heavy lifting in building its world and it accomplishes this without feeling superficial, lazy, or shallow. While I wouldn't dare minimize the feats and achievements of Tolkien, I would go as far to say that Ginsoki was able to emulate the depth of his world of Middle-earth as described in works such as Lord of the Rings and The Cimmerillion. Now, I mentioned that Tolkien was not only a prolific writer, but an academic. He worked as an English professor for more than 30 years until his eventual retirement. While his most famous works were The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, and even The Cimmerillion, which was published posthumously, Tolkien also published many academic works up until his death. Among these was an essay simply titled On Fairy Stories, widely considered to be one of his most influential scholarly works. Tolkien covers several topics within this essay, with one of the main intentions being a defense of fairy stories as a whole. This extended into explaining his interpretation of what a fairy story truly was. In doing this, he explains the concept of a secondary world, or a sub-creation, something fundamentally different from writing a singular story. This notion of a secondary or constructed world posits that it can shift away from storytelling, characters, and narrative, instead focusing on aspects of the world in and of themselves. To quote the essay, it was in fairy stories that I first divined the potential of the words and the wonder of things such as stone and wood and iron, tree and grass, house and fire, bread and wine. What did he mean by this? We are able to explore things within a secondary world beyond its presented narrative. This is important not because we must explore these things, but because we can. A normal story requires the observer to remain on a railroaded path because nothing lies outside of the view of its plot. An observer of a constructed world, however, could veer off this path at any time and find completely realized sections of the world they might never see in the story. To better illustrate this, think of both of these worlds as explorable maps in a video game. In the first one, you might be able to explore several places because they are story relevant, but there will either be invisible walls or large tracts of empty land anywhere the story doesn't intend to take you at some point. In the latter case, you can explore in any direction and probably find fully fleshed out locations and histories that could be completely unrelated to the plot of the game. The world is not centered around you, the protagonist. It's not centered around anybody. The story simply happens to exist within the world. When storytelling is done right, even if the reader is capable of understanding that imaginary creatures like elves, dwarves, and orcs do not exist, they are framed within a world that has an internal, logical consistency. The reader can see the world as believable within its own rationality. This is a concept Tolkien refers to as secondary belief. A secondary world doesn't need to follow the logic of the real world, because it follows its own logic. We as readers can immerse ourselves within this world, comprehending it in such a way that we see it as real. According to Tolkien, it is not so important that a secondary world displaces itself as far from reality as possible, because all secondary worlds innately are creations of our own imaginations, which are already founded in reality. Fostering secondary belief can be done simply by creating an organic world, regardless of its origins or derivation from actual history. The importance is not on the presence of the fantastical, but on the presence of the mundane and the rational within the fantasy. This is important because quite a bit of Gensokyo's world building comes from its mirrored reality, our reality. Gensokyo not only exists parallel to our world, but within the context of real time. 
Events from the real world, whether they be past or present, slowly drip through Gensokyo's barrier, either partially or whole, to form new context within the world. You see characters reference Neil Armstrong by name, or religious figures from history. You watch a group of fairies examine the flag that was supposedly placed on the moon by Americans. You see real-world video game consoles and electronics find their way into stores. Reimu plays with a smartphone. Just as our world is living and evolving, we see Gensokyo evolve and react to our world in parallel. Where most secondary worlds are immersive by isolating themselves within the bounds of their own rules, the Toho Project thrives and augments while employing a shared universe. Seeing the characters, the world in its fantasy and mundanity, seeing it all react to aspects that we live through in everyday life makes the world feel organic. It makes it feel alive, like it really does exist. For all the Middle Earths and galaxies far, far away, nothing feels quite as real, quite as personal as the world of Gensokyo. The world was constructed like a model aeroplane. No, 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 but it existed in posse and in a large uh, scale uh, yeah. plan before The Hobbit was written. The Hobbit was in fact originally an, an attempt to write something outside it and begin to into it. So that you had invented, literally invented the world before you even wrote The Hobbit? Oh, yes, indeed. Yes. Why? Why? Uh, I don't think so. I could not uh, really think why one wishes to create a thing like that. As always, thanks again for watching. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing for more Toho-related content. Despite its already immense size, Toho continues to grow. As such, I will continue to cover it. What the fuck?